Chris Hurst is the European head of digital at Nielsen Sports. Having previously worked at BBC Sport, the Premier League and the International Cricket Council, he's not helping us feel any better about ourselves. Please welcome to the stage, Chris Hurst. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as it's a Friday afternoon and we're in Prague, I thought I would treat myself to talking about three of my biggest passions, which are sport, digital, and data. And in the next 15 minutes, um, hopefully share with you how I think data can change the sports digital world as we know it today. And it is um, worth um, starting off by just sharing, actually, it's a pretty amazing time to be a sports fan. I was talking to my family about the fact I was going to go and do this talk in Prague, and we were reflecting on my first ever family holiday to America back in 1990. We went to Disney World, absolutely incredible holiday, got to go to the Magic Kingdom, see Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse for the first time. But as a sports fan, it took me two days to find out the results of my football team, because in 1990, I didn't have a mobile phone, there wasn't the internet, and I had to wait for the British newspapers to be flown from London to Miami and then go to the, the local news agent just to check the score. And because my football team wasn't doing particularly well at the time, all I got was the result, not even who scored. Compare that as if I was to take my two nieces, and if they're watching the live stream, Amelia and Jessica, Uncle Chris is not making a promise here. If I were to take them to, to Florida, not only would I be able to get goal notifications on my mobile phone. Not only would I be able to follow play-by-play -play commentary on Twitter, I'd probably be able to watch a live stream of the game on my mobile phone. And also, probably follow behind-the-scenes shots on Snapchat or Instagram stories. It, it really is an incredible time to be a sports fan and be in the venue, at home, or on the move. There's so many different ways to consume content. We've obviously talked already a little bit about what's driving that change. So that's obviously the rise of the mobile phone. That's the rise of the internet. But something that content that people want to consume, as Steve Bartlett and Mo talked about earlier, via their mobile, is sport. Facebook estimated last year there are 650 million Facebook users who like um, a sports team, player, or league. And in 2016, even in a crazy year, of Trump election win, Brexit, yep, the British person had to mention Brexit while in Europe. Um, it was Rio 2016 that was the most talked about trend on Twitter during the course of the year. There's also um, a big change from 1990 in that when newspapers and broadcasters were the content creators, now everybody's a content creator. And again, it's an incredible time to be a sports fan with brilliant content coming out from a range of different sports, from the likes of the NBA, um, Manchester United. And there's also new ways in which sports fans can interact with their teams. Last summer, Manchester United signed Zlatan Ibrahimovic. A skeptical fan tweeted Manchester United, uh, wondering whether he really would be a good signing for Manchester United, and whether he would score 10 goals. Well, got a lot of admiration for the Manchester United social media manager, because six months after that person tweeted and Zlatan scored his 10th goal of the season, that person got a reply back from Manchester United saying, surprise. So it's an amazing opportunity for sports teams to interact with their fans. It doesn't always go so well, though, as the Washington Capitals found out when they tweeted one of their fans congratulating them on an amazing face swap to which Emily Longton replied, that's just my dad and me, but thanks. So there are advantages and disadvantages to social media. And obviously with great content, highly engaged fans, teams are trying to find out how they can move along the scale of acquire, engage, and monetize. And when you think about the large social media following that football clubs have, this is from earlier in the season. Barcelona and Real Madrid have actually now passed 100 million fans on Facebook. Incredible um, fan sizes that I'm sure everybody in this room would love to have as their social media community. Um, they want to know 
well, what's the value of having all these Facebook fans? Traditionally, in the sports world, we've been able to measure sponsorship by working out, for example, if Man United were playing Arsenal, what's the value to Chevrolet of having their brand on the front of shirt when, they, when Manchester United play Arsenal on TV? Or what's the value to Adidas of having their advertising boards um, appear on television? Well, this season, we've launched a new product at Nielsen Sports called Social 24, which uses the same methodology that we use um, in terms of TV valuation and applied that to digital and social. So what we do, we're tracking the Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter profiles of the 26 leading football teams in Europe, not only looking at their own profiles in terms of the value that they're generating for five sponsors, but also looking at the accounts of leagues and also a panel of 35 leading news and uh, media websites um, and their social media accounts from across Europe. I won't get into the detailed methodology um, now. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, we, we calculate that value using the, the same exposure methodology that we use for TV, but also give added value to branded content, hence the engagement value to give a total value. And that's allowed us to create a league table of which teams are generating the most value for their partners on social media. This is just taken from um, a small section of the season earlier in the year. But you can see clubs are generating huge value for their partners. And the likes of Barcelona, Real Madrid are doing a great job at providing exposure for their sponsors via their social channels. Especially, and, and you can compare both the value that they're generating versus their fan size to see who's performing particularly well. So Bayern Munich um, are a team that have been doing um, particularly well um, on social media as well. And we can even break that data down into lots of different um, ways. So you can compare which team is generating most value for their partners on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube. You can look at what type of content's performing best. And you can even break it down to the most valuable social media assets. So as someone who loves sport, digital, and data, I'm only five months into the job, but it's really exciting to think what we can do with all of this information. Just a very quick case study, and we looked at the El Clasico game between uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona um, at the new Camp back in December. And what's really important is to try and consider what is the, um, the place of social media in the wider media landscape. So in terms of TV value, TV still dominates in terms of driving value for sponsors through front of shirt or LED boards. But social media now accounts for 12% of the value that's being generated. For Barcelona, as the home team who have more sponsor assets at the ground, social media is a relatively small portion of the total media value generated. But for Real Madrid, in the El Clasico back in December, as the away team, social media provided 41% of the total media value that they were generating. So shows A, there's a huge opportunity for, for teams on social media, but B, also I think it's a big reminder that everyone should be measuring it because it's huge value being generated that if you're not capturing that, you're missing out on what you can report as a club back to your sponsor. And as I mentioned, there's lots of really exciting and interesting things that we can do with this data. So for example, using some of our social bakers data that we take and combining that with sports data, we've been able to compare the posting strategies of teams on a match day and look at the number of interactions that they get from uh, content on different channels. And you could see by this, for example, um, which is taken from one Premier League club between August and December, for 8% of their posts being on Instagram, they actually generated 48% of total interactions. So potentially an, op an opportunity to post more on that channel. And we're beginning to use social bakers data, sports data, and obviously Nielsen sports data of our own to look at what is the impact of when a team wins, loses, or draws, which I think is really interesting. And ultimately, what value does that generate on different days? You'll see by this chart, again taken from a Premier League club um, back in February, um, there's a huge opportunity on a match day to drive great value via social media channels. And yes, reach and engagement will always be really important metrics for social media content creators. But actually, using the data set that we have, 
we can now introduce new metrics for teams, particularly those keen on monetizing their social channels. And for example, look at the number of posts that have any form of sponsor exposure in them. And I know some people in this room will be thinking, well, I'm nervous about making too many of my posts have sponsor content in. But let's look at some examples. Goals are one of the most popular moments on social media. Would there be any difference to the fan if the Seville graphic with the player with the folded arms actually had the player with unfolded arms so you'd be able to see the front of his shirt in the way that Borussia Dortmund and Tottenham have created some great social media graphics that really stand out in a very crowded newsfeed? What are the challenges for content teams in thinking about how do you create social media graphics that work across different platforms? So Manchester City's goal graphic, and, and, and I will say Manchester City are one of the best teams at delivering social and uh, digital content. Manchester City's a Twitter graphic um, on the left of your screen, really good delivery, great exposure for the sponsor. Their Facebook example, if they move the word goal slightly below Kevin De Bruyne's name, still a great fan experience, but it will deliver increased value for their partner. And then take the Tottenham Hotspur example providing exactly the same information to the fan in terms of the starting 11, again, a key moment for, for clubs that they own on social media. But the treatment that they provide on the right-hand side of the screen, which A, in my opinion, is a better mobile-friendly experience, but secondly, provides great exposure for their kit partners. Uh, I, I think that challenge becomes less of a, a debate for content creators, because actually, in a perfect world, what you want to achieve is great reach, great engagement, and also drive great value for your commercial partners as well. So in terms of kind of five thoughts to leave with you um, today and, and how you can apply some of this learning to your own areas of work, because I realize not everybody will work in sport um, in this room, I think challenge yourself to think beyond the traditional metrics of social media reach and engagement and, and use data in creative ways to create new metrics of your own. Understand the value you're getting um, for your commercial partners on social media from your brand activations by measuring them along with the way in which you traditionally measure TV. Challenge your creative teams, as I showed with some of the graphics, um, to create content in a way that both drives value for your sponsors um, and also delivers a great fan experience. Continue to combine data and editorial insight, benchmark yourself against the competition and learn from them, learn from best practice, not just in your own field, but others. And finally, always remember your audience. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you today um, and now look forward to the panel session. Thank you.